I have fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished the course. In the future, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all those who have loved his appearing. Those words from the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8, written toward the end of his life, were only possible because of a decision he made years earlier. When he met Jesus Christ and realized that the direction of his life was all wrong, that there were things above, there was a risen Savior, there was a coming King. And because of that change in Paul's life, we have the inspired Word of God through all the letters which he wrote. Oh, the majesty of God's creatures, this picture of the eagle, isn't it majestic? A friend of ours in Alabama took this shot earlier in the week along the banks of the Tennessee River near Wilson Dam in Colbert County, Alabama. And I thought of this God-made creature with a purpose, an aim, a task to fulfill, taking hold of that branch and off to build a nest. And so I encourage us today from the Word of God with Paul and with so much we see in the world that God has made to aim high and then run hard with all our might and strength and energy. Some of you may remember the name Eric Liddell. He was known as the Flying Scotsman. He was born in 1902 to missionary parents in China. In fact, he thought he was Chinese for the early part of his life. He was a very accomplished athlete and went to school in Edinburgh, Scotland, and then in Cambridge in England. He also developed a very strong faith, and in addition to his rugby and other sporting events, he would constantly talk to other young people about Jesus Christ and the fact that there was a higher, better, grander race to be run than anything that was here on the earth. In 1924, for the Olympics in Paris, Liddell had trained for the 100-meter race, and it was almost a given that he would take the gold. But when the schedule came out, the heats to qualify for that race were going to take place on a Sunday. And because of Liddell's faith, he would not compromise, and he told the leaders and all those over him, I cannot run. It's the Lord's Day. The government of Great Britain pressured him. The athletic director, all that were involved in helping to get this gold for the home team, he was ridiculed. He was laughed at. His name made headlines all over the world. And in the movie Chariots of Fire in 1981, he had a rival who also wanted to pass that heat and win that gold. And because Liddell took his name out, the other man who was his competitor on the team took his place and won the gold for Great Britain. Liddell then had the opportunity to run in the 400 meter race for which he had not trained and his body and his preparation weren't really suited to that race, but he took hold of it. And to the amazement of the world, he won the gold. And today his name stands not primarily because of the physical award he obtained, but because he had such a respect for the things of God, the commandments of God, the will of God. And so he would tell people, that's the race that counts. Love Jesus Christ, serve him, follow him, and whatever you're able to do on this earth can't compare with that great prize. During World War II, by the way, he was only 22 years old when that critical moment came. He was living in China, and the Japanese invaded and took many people in China, including Liddell, into horrible concentration camps. And in 1945, he died as a result of a brain tumor at only such a very young, young age. What an example for you and me when we look at the New Testament record and the inspiration and the encouragement 
to look higher, look beyond, stretch ourselves, be willing to strain and exert with the energy that God gives us, one day to be able to say with Paul, I've fought, I've kept the faith, I've finished the course, I'm ready to receive that award. The story is told of a man that was lost in the snow driving late at night, and he finally found some tire tracks, and he was encouraged, and so he started following those tracks, and they got wider and wider and wider, and he thought, I'm headed toward a main road. He was so glad he was going to have a good outcome. But to mark where he had been, he decided he would set out a flare in the side of the snow. He kept driving and driving and driving and came back to that flare. He'd been following his own tracks. That's why they were getting wider and easier and smoother. And though his confidence was growing, he was no closer to his destination. And the Bible warns us about running a race that really doesn't lead anywhere because it's about popularity or possessions or position or prominence in something that will die when we leave this earth. In Philippians chapter 3, we discover that Paul found true north. You may enjoy your GPS like I do. Typically, I have it set where it shows me where I'm going to turn left or turn right or go straight. But there's a little button I can tap, and it turns the map so it shows me true north. And then it doesn't make it quite as easy. Turn, it will show me a different kind of turn in that blue line. I have to be more careful. So I keep wanting to go back and set it to where it suits me, where it fits the way I like to know I have the right directions. We're encouraged again and again to realize that what the world calls true north is not and to aim the compass toward that which God intends for us. Notice how Paul said, I'm determined to lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. It's impossible to describe the impact of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul. Recorded in Acts 9 and also chapters 22 and 26, he was on the road to Damascus with letters of authority to find the people that follow the way, this Jesus of Nazareth, and arrest them and bring them back bound to Jerusalem so that he could vote against them, try to get them to blaspheme, and then watch them die. You remember he held the coats of those that stoned Stephen in Acts chapter 7. But that day on the road to Damascus, he was blinded by a light, Saul was, and he heard a voice from heaven and he said, who are you, Lord? And the glorified Savior said, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. And so it came to Saul's attention as he became blind, having seen the majesty and the splendor and the radiance of the one whom he had opposed, that Jesus was King of kings and Lord of lords. He had overcome sin and death and all the stress and all the trials Clay led us in that song, Follow Me, and it talked about how we may think our lives are difficult at times, but Jesus says, look what I went through. And all of that hit Saul of Tarsus, and he fell to the ground along with those who were in his company, and never again could he look back, never again could he be what he was, or seek what he sought, or pursue what he had once gone after. And so Philippians 3 records this marvelous setting. If you open your Bible there again, we're going to divide it in three parts. First, we'll think about direction, and then determination, and finally, destination. And I'd like to offer a guarantee that I believe comes from the Word of God to everyone present today. If you will have in their proper place these three things, direction, determination, and destination, you will be able to say when the time comes, I fought the good fight, I kept the faith, I finished the course. Here let's consider Paul as the accountant because you notice how the scripture was read, I count all things but loss. We all have different things we score that we measure, that we think are valuable. We have our ledger, maybe our budget, maybe our layout of 
the way we evaluate, this is important, this is not so much, I think I'll do this and not that. What happened to Paul was the books were turned completely upside down. What he thought measured status and accomplishment and success, he's now come to realize in the ultimate sense, all of that was nothing compared to the new count, knowing Jesus Christ. Being found in him, not with my own righteousness, as if I could attain it by meriting status with God through the law. I want to know Christ. I want to be conformed to his life, to his suffering and his death, and I want to attain to his resurrection. And now I'm looking at who I am and where I'm going and what my life is about in those terms, not as I did before. As we look together there at the scripture, you can see Paul gives a very stern warning in this book that is overall filled with joy. He's in Roman prison and he's lifting up those who read these words because he still has that confidence and assurance of belonging to Jesus Christ. He talked about God's unseen hand and the providence he had experienced, uh, Paul had there in the prison. But here he's concerned about the dangers of false teachers, those that would destroy and ravage and wreak havoc on the church like Paul once did when he was on the other side. These homeless, wandering, hungry, ravenous beasts, that's what he's talking about. And so he three times uses the word beware. The evil workers the false circumcision, the dogs. The false circumcision relates to the fact that people had come into Philippi. The entire book of Galatians centers on this theme. Chris has been preaching about it in the evenings, saying that you must undergo physical circumcision. You must practice the Jewish law. You must observe the rituals and the routines given under the law of Moses in order to get to heaven. And this is the way you sort of climb the ladder. You check this off, check this off, check, and you become worthy and you obligate God to save you. Paul had lived that way. He was raised as a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was circumcised, look at verse five. He was from the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was zealous persecuting the church. He was blameless. You understand that the relative sense regarding the law, he had been faithful to those rules that he had followed. And now Paul says, I could have confidence in those things more than anybody else. Because if you look at the track record, if you look at the scorecard, and I was running that race, I was doing quite well. But now he said, I have realized that the score of what I'm able to do to buy salvation ends up zero. But through obedient faith in Christ, trust and obedience, commitment to Christ, following Christ, I can be right with God as a gift of his grace. It's not because I am perfect in every way. I, Whatever I could lose, if I could know Christ, the rest of it can be rubbish. One Bible uses the strong word dung, that which is refuse, that which is repulsive, that which is abhorrent. I realize you put all that on the scale, and on the other side you put a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and that tips the scale a thousand times over. And so he says in verse 7, whatever things were gained to me, I've counted as loss. In fact, all things, here's the surpassing value. I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to be conformed to his death. I'm ready to suffer shame, rejection, persecution, even martyrdom, Paul said. Because that's what the Lord did for me. And so in Paul's change of direction, we see he reversed his accounting method. 
and the things that he used as measurements of what life was all about. If you and I choose that same direction, that's the first key in our text today to one day receiving that prize and that award. That brings us then to verse 12 and following. Think about Paul now as the athlete. He's in this race of his life. The stakes couldn't be higher. They're not just here on earth, but they last beyond the, the grave. He would write in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, regarding the Greek games of that time, all these that train and exercise and work themselves so that they can do well, all they get is a perishable wreath, a garland of flowers that will fade away. But he said, we're looking for an unfading crown of glory. And therefore, he said in 1 Corinthians 9, I run as not without aim. Here in Philippians chapter 3, I've summarized some of the things in my own words that Paul is indicating. Twice he says, I have not yet attained it. It helps me understand that God looks at our direction, realizing that we lack perfection. And as we walk in the light, 1 John 1, 5 through 9, the blood of Christ cleanses us. We confess our sins. We acknowledge them. We turn from them. And we continue to say, with all humility, as did the apostle, I have not yet attained. And then he says, I'm pressing on. He says that twice also. The Greek word to pursue, to chase after, to set your sights on something and give everything you have to cross that finish line. And then, as we mentioned a moment ago, Christ Jesus laid hold of me. I want to lay hold of that very same purpose. And so I'm possessing, I aim to, that for which Christ possessed me. And it makes me think, you know, we can tell with Paul what the Lord's purpose was. He's going to be an apostle to the Gentiles. He's going to take good news to all the world. It's not revealed for you and me in specific words what purpose God has for you individually. But when we have our direction and we run with determination, God, through his providence, as we discussed before, will help us find our niche, our ministry, our role in the local church, and in the mission to take the gospel to the world. Forgetting what lies behind, that is, I won't let the past destroy the present. Someone said, I want my past to refine me, but not define me. Certainly we learn from where we've been, but we can't spend our energy looking in that rearview mirror. We need to look out the windshield at what God has ahead. I'm called upward. So many times we may focus in an inward direction. It's about me, my feelings, my preferences, my desires, my happiness. Or again, we may look backward as he said he refuses to do. But when we look up, you might make a note of Colossians 3, 1 to 4. If you've been raised with Christ, talking about your immersion, when you were immersed, buried and raised with Jesus Christ to become a Christian, to be saved, keep seeking things above. Not backward, not downward, and not inward. And then he uses this interesting term twice. On the one hand, he says, I'm not perfect. That's true of all of us. But then he speaks in verse uh, 15 of those who are mature. It's the same Greek word, but it has two different senses. It's not that you're perfect, but you can be mature in the sense of growing to a certain level of your faith and your walk. And so Paul recognizes in the church, and we do today, we're not all at the same mile marker in the race. Some are just starting. How about all these new Christians? A dozen to 15, just in the last recent time. 
and others that are more seasoned that are or should be farther along in their understanding and their wisdom and their grasp of the things of God. And so we're all on a journey. And so we're patient and we're kind and we help those that are starting out. And we look up to those that are in the faith for a longer period of time and we urge those who are more mature, step up, stand up, aim high and run and show us the way. Dissatisfaction is a wonderful thing. Have you ever thought about it? Because when you are dissatisfied with something, you will work to change it. But if you think it's smooth and it's okay and it's good, you'll continue just the way you are. So fill in the blank. I'm not satisfied. And whatever you put there, you can be sure that if you're dissatisfied enough about it, you will take action. For example, if you are dissatisfied with your knowledge of God's Word, you'll be at every service of the church that you possibly can because you're not satisfied. You'll be in Bible studies in this building and in your home and with your family. If you're not satisfied with your prayer life, you know what you'll do about it. If you're not satisfied with your outreach, touching your network of relationships to make an impact for Jesus Christ, you will do something about it. Now, the reverse of that is, for me and for you, if I do nothing about whatever it is, I'm satisfied with it. I know what Bible I need to know. My prayer life is what I think it, uh, is sufficient. My evangelistic efforts. You say, wait a minute. No, I'm not really satisfied. Well, then let your dissatisfaction build until you take action. Because what you're dissatisfied with reveals your character, how you view yourself and other people, how you approach money and things, what your dreams are and your priorities, your definition of success and failure, your activities and your schedule will all grow out of, to some degree, that with which you are dissatisfied. Only when you're not satisfied with something Will you change what you're doing until you're satisfied? Excellence and mediocrity. There's a fork in the road. Aim high. Higher than you ever have before. Don't settle for less. Don't be stuck following your own tracks in the snow. Look beyond. Stretch yourself. Take on some strain. Put some pressure on yourself. It's amazing about Paul. Paul knows Christ, but he says, Oh, I want to know Christ. But Paul, Paul knows Christ, but he's dissatisfied with his knowledge of Christ. He's running the race, but he's dissatisfied with where he is on the road. And so to grow in those things, to be excellent, to excel, what a great goal that is. That brings us to the destination. Paul now is the anticipator. And he warns again, and he wants Christians to know that he's trying to set an example that they can follow. And there are others who walk according to this pattern, this type, this example. Note the good, faithful, strong-minded people and follow their tracks in the snow because they're headed toward heaven. But then he talks about choosing the end. Decide where you want to go, and then you'll know how to begin. Don't start with just what comes into your life, but start with your final point. And then these dire words... Were there ever truer words spoken of our culture today regarding those who are enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ? There are those that hate the cross, Paul said. There are those whose God is their belly. They're seeking to please their own appetites and fill up their lives with what brings them pleasure. They don't mind being ashamed. They don't even blush. They take glory in how different they can be in their morality 
in their behavior, in their priorities, and their minds are set on this world, their end is destruction, the scripture says. So Paul sets the two racetracks side by side in contrast. The one which he has chosen when he reversed course and now headed toward heaven, and the one that is so opposite to it that leads to hell. And then these remarkable words. Jesus Christ is coming again. And he's going to take your lowly body, your physical existence, that which you now know, which is perhaps older and weaker and declining, limited in so many ways, and he is going to transform your body so that it conforms with his glorious state. That boggles the mind. 1 John 3, 1 to 3 says, Now we're the children of God. It's not yet appeared what we shall be, but when he does appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. If that is your destination, to be glorified with Jesus Christ, to resemble Jesus Christ, to identify with Jesus Christ, that determines your direction. And that sets your determination that leads to this final destination. Oh, what a great future. We began with that today. I fought the fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. You and I want to be able to say that or know that in our own lives. In order to do so, let's aim high and then run and give everything we have. And then notice how Paul speaks of the plurality. Let us. It's not about me, my, my, and mine but rather we, us, our and ours. And the church, like this great church, is a team of runners helping each other to do what? Aim high and run. We've talked today about Paul's reversal. Is there a change that God would have you make in your life from darkness to light, from death to life, from following self to being baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, rising to begin in this new journey, this exciting journey that leads home. Or if we could pray for you, if we could encourage you somewhere, where are you in your race? If you would choose to respond, please do it. We're going to stand and sing.